the panel is um, called is universal jurisdiction a useful tool against impunity we have well not a panel but a bunch of uh, surface uh, and we have we have uh, some people who are experts in different fields but fields that are convergent because they help the society move right now we already have an approach or a mindset or an <coughs> idea fair enough to understand universal jurisdiction in an attempt to try and see if it is an efficient tool or at least a necessary tool in the fight <coughs> against impunity after it started right after the second world war consequences of latin american dictatorships over the 70s the ad hoc trials international criminal court also the case law that uh, we found with human rights courts such as the inter-american human rights court and also the european court for human rights we've evolved we've found a few <coughs> defects, but also we've identified the needs of universal jurisdiction. And at the same time, we are faced with new challenges and new concepts. One of those challenges uh, that would be transitional justice, as has been said before. There are some peacekeeping processes all over the world, uh, such as in Colombia, where some concepts are discussed now, but were not discussed before that. How much are we willing to give in in our pursuit of peace? And what's the role of universal justice and universal jurisdiction in this scenario? And in Spain, this is an ongoing debate, and that is transnational organized crime, which is out there, that it's cooperation based, and which requires the coordination of all states. What's the role of universal jurisdiction? for those crimes. So we have an example. Today, earlier today, it was announced that seven more drug dealers transporting 40,000 kilos of, of drug on a barge had been released here in Spain at the criminal court. So this adds up to 43 criminals that have been released. So maybe we have this corridor of impunity in the field of organized <coughs> criminality. So those are new ideas, new concepts. What about, and this is a question open to all the panelists, what about the crisis, the recession, this financial crisis will also be limiting us on our uh, enforcement of universal jurisdiction? What's the role of different UN bodies in the development or complementarity of universal jurisdiction? What about the academic world? What's its role when trying to train and educate our young people? Earlier today, the civil society was mentioned as something that is necessary to dynamize not just the promotion of human rights, but also to make people uh, aware of the need for universal jurisdiction. So this is paramount. What about political world? Our, our, our judiciary people who need to take into account our citizens and need to question all items regarding sovereignty, which is to be universal and it's been said before. Because it is not national jurisdiction, it's not na national sovereignty that we're discussing, but we're discussing universal jurisdiction, universal sovereignty. Uh, it, it affects us all. You are a man who travels around the world and you made a difference in the enforcement of universal jurisdiction with the arrest warrant against Pinochet, which, threw, which, which somehow conveyed a message that uh, got to every corner in, in, in the world. So there can be no room for a criminal, someone who's abused human rights. There's no way it, they can feel safe. And that's why we have universal jurisdiction for. 
Anna is a catedrática acreditada. So let's start with Anna, who has a chair in law, in criminal law, in the University of Salamanca. She's also holding a degree in law by the University of Salamanca. She's been part of different research groups focusing on corruption, financial delinquency, organized criminality, and also the principle of international justice. What's what's the principle underlying universal jurisdiction in the academic world? What's